co-stars and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. Good news, our explosion video from a few days ago did pretty well in the face of a larger hot streak we've been having with war videos in general. And it made us realize that y'all really appreciate the finer things in life, like death and destruction. Of course, what could be more devastatingly destructive and fatal than nuclear blasts? In the explosion video, we already discussed how a lead refrigerator would not have protected Indiana Jones from being obliterated from a nuclear blast in about 10 different ways. So on the heels of that, I thought today we'd discuss myths surrounding nuclear explosions that are represented in film. Nuclear blast scenes are some of the most shocking scenes in cinema history. I'll never forget watching the nuclear nightmare scene in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. I sat there frozen as it unfolded. And as the nuclear shockwave spread across Los Angeles, simultaneously across the mind of little American Ben, eyes glued to the TV screen, spread sociopathy. But I digress. This scene was heralded in its time for its scientific accuracy. I'm not sure about Sarah Connor's perfectly intact skeleton remaining upright on the fence even after her skin is melted away by the nuclear fireball, but it was the 90s, a time when scientific accuracy meant Norm at the local pub confirmed all of your deeply held beliefs and paranoias. Everyone loves their Norm, but it's 2018, so we have to be more thorough. With that said, let's dive into some myths and misconceptions. Listen, we can nitpick the details from just about any movie that involves nukes. In the Avengers, a bunch of Warhawks order an F-35 warplane pilot to launch a nuclear missile at New York City in order to defeat the invading extraterrestrial shapeshifters. And I am all for the genocide of aliens before they can get us. But as Iron Man pursues the weapon, we see in his helmet that it's the AGM-154 Joint Standoff Weapon, which is a glide bomb, a type of bomb that has wings but no engine, and yet the missile in the film seemed to have an engine as a flame bellowed out behind it. But we are not going to nitpick like that today. Why? Because the movie, like many other films, has lots of really unrealistic things, like magical hammers, giant green monsters, and Samuel L. Jackson. We want bigger idea myths, like the suitcase nuke, a favorite plot device of fiction. Jack Bauer's search for suitcase nukes was a central plot line of 24's sixth season. The idea of the suitcase nuke could even be seen on screen as early as 1955's Kiss Me Deadly, a film made in the midst of the proliferation of nuclear weapons technology and arsenals. And suitcase nukes make for compelling drama, because everyone fears the rogue nuke that explodes out of nowhere, changing life forever when one second before, everything seemed okay. After all, former Senator Byron Dorgan of North Dakota once said at a hearing, perhaps the most likely threat of a nuclear attack is from a suitcase nuclear weapon in a rusty car on a dock in New York City. But as the former assistant director of the FBI's Weapons of Mass Destruction Directorate, Vahid Majidi once said, the suitcase nuke is an exciting topic that really lends itself to movies. No one has been able to truly identify the existence of these devices. Well, what Majidi means is at least not in the general way we think about them. The truth is, fear of a suitcase nuke does derive from devices that have existed in reality. I know what you're thinking. Okay, Mr. American Ben, what did the Soviets do now? What irresponsible tech did those Russian madmen invent? So here's the thing. It was the US to first create such weapons. In the 1950s, the US made the first so-called portable nuke, known as the Special Atomic Demolition Munition, or the SADM. Saddam. 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 The SADM was a backpack nuke that could be used to blow up dams, tunnels, or bridges. But while one person could lug it on his back, it had to be placed by a two-man team. Nonetheless, these weapons were never used in combat and are not employed today. Aside from this though, the suitcase nuke is mostly a myth. For now. Because they're just not a practical weapon, especially not for a rogue actor to obtain. Nuclear devices are made from either plutonium, a product of nuclear reprocessing, or uranium, which requires a complex enrichment process in order to ready for use as a nuclear weapon. According to the Union of Concerned Scientists, 
it takes a whole lot of plutonium and even more uranium to create an atomic bomb. Plutonium is incredibly difficult to obtain. One would have to get it from a state that engages in nuclear reprocessing, a controversial undertaking. And if one was able to procure it from a state, it would imply complicity in terrorism on the part of the government at hand. Something that would be incredibly unwise given the chemical footprints that the final device would bear. Stealing plutonium, on the other hand, is nearly impossible and would require the skills of the highest level ninjas in the world. You see, I am a trained master in each of the weapons of battle. Uranium might be a little bit easier to acquire than plutonium, but the amount needed for a nuclear detonation would be much too heavy to carry around in a suitcase. It is too round on the top. It needs to be pointy. Round is not scary. Pointy is scary. This will put a smile on the faces of the enemy. They will think that it is a huge robot's dildo flying towards them. The real threat of terrorists obtaining a nuke is much different from the suitcase nuke we see in fictional narratives. As Ambassador Laura Holgate, a vice president of the Nuclear Threat Initiative explains, the real threat is not a fancy suitcase nuke, but rather a terrorist cell with nuclear material that has enough knowledge to make an improvised device. And how big would that device be? As Holgate adds, like SUV sized, way bigger than a suitcase. Next, we have to talk about electromagnetic pulses, or EMPs. An EMP is a burst of electromagnetic radiation created by a nuclear explosion that leads to rapidly changing electric and magnetic fields and could interfere and damage electronic devices by producing damaging current and voltage surges. In the film Broken Arrow, Major Vic Deakins is chasing down a couple hijacked nuclear bombs. One of the warheads is detonated by Deakins as part of his plan to escape with the other nuke. Just a quick side note, before the nuclear bomb detonates, Deakins orders his men to turn off their electronics. Turn your electronic equipment off now. For the record, this is unlikely to prevent damage to unshielded electronics. In theory, in the event of an EMP, the pulse's power will be absorbed and induced into the power grid. So anything plugged in is indeed most likely screwed. But a powerful EMP can still induce extremely high voltages and currents in an individual device's transistors and fry it. More centrally, upon detonation, the movie presents a pretty damn good underground blast, with a fireball bursting from the mine, a circular cave-in, and a rolling shockwave and the EMP from the blast starts frying electronics in the area. Just one issue with that. The blast is underground. In general, theories about nuclear EMPs causing damage across the power grid are dependent on the blast being a high altitude detonation. At high altitude, gamma rays can more easily spread out, hitting many upper atmosphere air molecules over a large area at once. The low density of air allows electrons to move freely and the intensity of the EMP is maximized. But with a detonation at a lower altitude, not only is the air denser, but many of the gamma rays would slam directly into the Earth. The rays would have a difficult time producing a large electric field that could result in a widespread EMP. And in this case, forget low altitude. The blast comes deep from within a mine. The ground would likely block the EMP altogether. You the man. I'm the man. Next, we're going to talk about nuclear launch procedure. In the movie The Sum of All Fears, the President of the United States makes the hard call to launch a nuclear attack. Strike. I'm sorry, sir. I give the order to strike it. When he does, we see a procedure unfold, as the film tries to portray some sense of checks to the President's ability to launch a nuclear weapon. But in leaving out so much of the process, the film still makes it seem that such an order is almost unilateral on the President's part. The entire process to launch a nuke, some of which we can't be sure of, is complicated. Thankfully, Bruce G. Blair, a former Minuteman missile launch officer and research scholar at Princeton University's program on science and global security, spelled out to Bloomberg what he knows about the procedure, some of which is depicted in the sum of all fears and much of which is not. We have no If the president is at a command center, like the White House Situation Room, he can begin the process to launch a nuke from there. 
If he is away from a command center, then the process starts with the nuclear football, which follows the president everywhere. The U.S. nuclear arsenal is capable of destroying each of your countries 14 times over. 15 in the case of North Korea, just to be sure. According to former White House Military Office Director Bill Gulley, the football, also known as the Presidential Emergency Satchel, contains four things. A black book containing the retaliatory options, a book listing classified site locations, a manila folder with eight or ten pages stapled together giving a description of procedures for the emergency alert system, and a three by five inch card with authentication codes. First, the president convenes a conference, whether in person at the White House or over a secure line with top civilian and military leaders. This group will help transmit the launch order and may brief the president on strike options. At the push of a button. At this point, the advisors present might try to convince the president to change his mind, but if they are not able to, the order must move forward for verification. In this step, the senior officer in the Pentagon war room must formally authenticate the president's identity. The order then goes out. The war room prepares the launch order containing the war plan, launch time and authentication codes, and broadcasts it to each worldwide command and directly to launch crews. The launch crews then take over opening locked safes to obtain SAS codes. They compare the SAS codes in the safe with those in the launch order. The crew then authenticates the order. And from here there are different processes depending on if the missiles are launched from a submarine or land. Ethan? We're too late. The missile's in the air. The missiles are then fired, and once launched, the attack cannot be called back. But that never stopped Tom Cruise. There has to be a way to abort the warhead. Then we have Crimson Tide, a movie that portrayed a fictionalized launch process from a submarine. The premise of the film being a submarine commander attempts to launch a nuclear missile without clear orders from Washington and then follows the mutiny that ensues. A plot that upset Navy officials and caused them to refuse to cooperate in the making of the film. In here right now. No, sir, I do not concur and I do not recognize your authority to relieve me under command under Navy regulations. Cobb, arrest this man and get him out of here! Navy spokesman Lieutenant Commander Ken Ross said at the time that there was no way a submarine commander would ever launch nuclear missiles without clear orders from the president. Then again, on the Russian side of the spectrum, there was Vasily Arkhipov the second in command on a Russian submarine in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, who when his commander believed that war had started and prepared to launch a nuclear weapon against the US, refused to agree to the launch and prevented a possible nuclear war. This was the basis for Crimson Tide, and Vasily Arkhipov on the other hand is remembered as the man who saved the world. Hey listen, I wish that Orville Redenbacher had never invented nuclear weapons. They don't bring much more than death and destruction. But now that they're here, we have to learn how to limit and control them. And in order to do that, we have to educate ourselves about the science behind them. And I hope that this video contributed to that in some small degree. Well, that's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe down below. And in the comments, let me know any other myths about nuclear war and nuclear weapons you'd like to see me talk about in a future video or a part two if you enjoyed this one. For now, remember, you are the villain in this movie we like to call life. And the sooner you realize that, the better it'll be for everyone. I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.